This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. And thanks for joining us at 7. I'm Rafael Sanchez here at the Storm Team 6 Tracking Center with meteorologist Kevin Gregory. It's a Storm Team 6 alert day. The rain and temperatures have something in common. Both are falling. And uh, Kevin, fill us in. And quickly. You yeah. know, the rain isn't heavy, but it's kind of a nuisance with this newfound temperature. Mm -hmm. But at least we knew it was coming, right? Temperature at 4 o'clock, 67 degrees. Where are we now? 48. That's in Indianapolis. Other spots already cooler than that, where the cold front arrived first. Can you kind of find Meridian Street here? This is looking north out of downtown from our Weather Now camera. I think what we call the ceiling, the cloud ceilings will improve this evening. In other words, in other words visibility will get better, but that'll take a while. We've got showers uh, right over Avon, 36 and 267, moving northeast towards Speedway, Eagle Creek. Even in spots where it doesn't look like it's raining, you're still probably getting at least a heavy mist. Rain will roll through Lafayette here from the southwest. All of this, as we're transitioning to the cooler temperatures, the cold front has now made its way into the Buckeye State. What it did immediately is give you about a 10 degree temperature drop and change the wind direction from southwest to northwest and it's a strong cool steady wind that will continue to push the drier air into the state tonight which means our rain will end fairly early overnight and then open the door to cooler temperatures we'll call it cold in spots 43 in Champaign 48 in Indy while it's 70 in Cincinnati between 9 and 11 showers pushing closer to the Buckeye State and then after midnight we'll pull away this is what you'll wake up to lots of sunshine for tomorrow so that means it will help us warm up, but will we warm up much? I'll have the answer coming up. Now, Kevin, thank you so much. It's an eyesore people living in the Richmond Hill subdivision on the south side of Indianapolis, one removed from their neighborhood. There you see it. They want to know why a home that caught fire back in May is still standing empty and untouched five months later. The burned out home is just steps away from where the deadly Richmond Hill explosion happened back in November of 2012. Going back to the explosion, we'd had several of those houses stand for, you know, a couple of years before they tore down. You know, we're just trying to get back to our new normal. And neighbors say they've begged the city to tear that down, calling it a safety hazard. Now, we went online and found that the Marion County Health Department and the city's business and neighborhood services have been out several times to inspect, citing trash, junk, debris, high weeds, and grass. But the fire department was investigating the house fire for some time, so an extension was granted to the homeowner to clean up that property. Now, the city has a pending demolition order on that home. They tell us the home owner has until November the 11th to come into compliance. Two more families have come forward to demand answers after more than a dozen Lawrence Township students were mistakenly given insulin last month. A total of three families may seek legal action against the school district and community health hospital. That error happened back on September the 30th at the McKenzie Career Center. On that day, 16 students expected to receive an injection for a tuberculosis test, but instead, they got insulin. Neither Lawrence Township Schools nor Community Health Hospital have explained how this happened. It's a problem that could impact anyone who gets their groceries delivered here in Indianapolis. A woman reached out to us after she says nearly $60 in extra charges showed up on her grocery delivery bill. Uh, Crystal Silver used the Kroger app to go online and order groceries for delivery to her home. But when she got that receipt, she noticed several extra items on the list, things she did not order. Her estimated cost was $115, but the final amount charged to her, $173. Now, it turns out Kroger uses a third-party delivery service called in Instacart. Their shoppers pick out the items, check out, and deliver the groceries. Now, each shopper receives a payment card from Instacart that is capped at the amount needed for each order. There is a credit line for item replacements, which is how the shopper was able to add more items. The final amount is then charged to the customer's account. I thought I was safe with Kroger. I mean, it was a Kroger app. I just did not know that they dealt with Instacart. You know, I think about my grandmother or my parents or, you know, people that really don't understand that um, or haven't noticed that their money is gone because you just, like I said, you see the Kroger, you know, logo and you think you're safe. 
Uh, Crystal now warns others to always check your final receipt and your bank account. An Instacart spokeswoman says the shopper who took Crystal's order has been suspended and deactivated from the platform. Uh, Crystal's bank has also refunded her money while the investigation is ongoing. Three Southern Indiana judges now face discipline stemming from a shooting at a downtown Indianapolis White Castle restaurant. The disciplinary charges come from the Indiana Commission of Judicial Qualifications. A Clark County judges Andrew Adams and Bradley Jacobs were wounded in the May 1st incident. Investigators say that Crawford County Judge Sabrina Bell joined Adams and Jacobs for a night of drinking while they were here for a conference. At the end of the night, they got into an argument with two men at the downtown White Castles. Uh, what investigators say Judge Bell flipped off the men. The fight then got physical and shots were fired. The three judges each have 20 days to file an answer to the charges filed now against them. Marion County has set a new day for the 2019 tax sale. A clerical error led to its cancellation. The new date is now February the 14th of 2020. The sale was set to take place yesterday and today, and county officials say that rescheduling the sale will allow delinquent taxpayers in danger of losing their home enough time now to pay the property taxes. Officials say parcels eligible for the sale in 2019 may be offered in the February sale if still available. This weekend, members of the local Latino community are getting a chance to connect with resources in our area. The Indiana Latino Expo kicked off today in Indianapolis. It is a free event which includes health screenings and a job and education fair. Organizers say they expect more than 10,000 people to show up there at the fairgrounds. Today we spoke to a mother and a daughter who drove from Lafayette to attend the education fair. They say events like these are important for many families. Especially for the students who um, are like a part of DACA or they're like, there's just that language barrier. Even for me, it's just like a struggle to like process the thought of going to college. So I think for people who are especially part of that, it's just they need this so they don't feel the stress and anxiety. If you couldn't make it today, the event runs again tomorrow from 8 to 5 at the State Fairgrounds. RTV6 is a proud media sponsor of the Indiana Latino Expo. Next, on the news at 7, a girl kidnapped for nearly a day returned home. What happened and who police hope to arrest? Plus, candy concerns. There's nothing sweet about what you're seeing right there. Why police are using this incident to warn families this Halloween season. The News at 7 continues right after this. Visit IndianaLatinoExpo.org. This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. It is a happy ending to a very frightening story tonight. Three-year-old Alora Lindemann is now back with her family after she was kidnapped in North Carolina. Police say that Alora's siblings had witnessed that kidnapping. They say a young woman approached them at a playground and then grabbed their sister and simply took off. She had been missing for nearly 24 hours when authorities got a call from a church six miles away from where Alora had last been seen. Early inside the church with the caller. We're out with the little girl. Hey, Cory, is it the little girl? Hey, Cory, yeah. We want to thank everybody for the prayers Mommy. and the thoughts. Mommy, I want to go home. We're going home. She wants to go home. We are happy that she is home. While Alora was found safely, her kidnapper did get away. Uh, police have surveillance pictures of the kidnapper and are launching now a massive search. Investigators say the woman who abducted Alora had no ties to the family. Imagine growing up knowing you've been adopted from an orphanage, only to later find out you had been considered missing. One man found his own photo on a kid's missing website. Maya Rodriguez explains how an age progression photo was amazingly accurate. I'll walk you through this step. For Joe Mullins, a face can tell a story. Everything about your face is etched into your skull. Mullins is the senior forensic imaging specialist at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Over the past 20 years, he's created thousands of age-progressed photos of missing children. I always say it in age progression as an image based on hope or hope that the right person sees it. We hope we get these you know, children back home where they belong. This is what we have to start with. But how that happens can be an incredible journey. Just ask Steve Carter. Shock would definitely be one of them. Um, I think another one would be 
you know, kind of amazement. Carter always knew he had been adopted from an orphanage in Hawaii. What he didn't know was how he got there. Yeah, you know, you grow up with this story in your head of, you know, uh, you know, a family member decided that I would have a better life if, you know, it was with somebody else. So it's kind of that loss and, you know, regret that you, you didn't have that connection. But then to find out that, you know, that wasn't the case, it was something totally different, is kind of a, a big pill to swallow. He learned the truth decades after his adoption. After seeing news of a missing persons case, he had an idea to search missing kids' photos online, wondering what he could find. And he found himself staring back at him. Because mine was, I mean, pretty much spot on. Um, they even got the smirk, which I thought was amazing. Turns out, he and his mother disappeared in the mid-1970s. She was never found. It was true that he came from an orphanage, but no one knows how he got there. And no one realized he had been a missing child. He's since reunited with his birth father and a sister, who always believed he was alive. Something that he says wouldn't have been possible without the age progression. It allows that sense of hope for families that I think is really necessary. Joe Mullins says stories like Steve's give his work so much meaning. It does work. At least this, it, it can provide those answers and it, these images are a beacon of hope. Hope and answers to lifelong questions. In Philadelphia, I'm Maya Rodriguez reporting. Hope is a great thing. Tonight, police have a warning about candy ahead of Halloween. Officers in John's Jonestown, Pennsylvania, found candy that looks a lot like nerd ropes, but these were laced with 400 milligrams of THC, the active chemical found in marijuana. They were found during a raid, and investigators are warning parents to please double check their kids' candy this season. Drug lace edibles have become very popular, and many are packaged to look a lot like regular candy. A North Carolina family lost everything when the RV they were living in went up in flames this week. The first responders on the scene were especially touched by the family's six year old son, Damon, who was simply devastated when he realized that his beloved Batman Halloween costume was lost. And that's when they decided to help out. A sheriff's department captain drove straight over to Walmart and bought Damon, as you can see, a new costume of the caped crusader. With Halloween coming up and obviously just lost everything that he had. Halloween's a, a big deal to kids and, and you know that was the one thing that he had been looking forward to. Pretty excited. I just told him that sheriff's deputies need uh, need all the Batmans that we can get out here helping us fight crimes. Good Samaritans at work. Batman to the Batcave. Damon was thrilled with the new costume and he's even started calling first responders his own personal superheroes. Coming up, lights, action, Indy. That's right, not Hollywood, but Indianapolis. The festival rolling out the red carpet for some of the country's and the world's top filmmakers. But first, let's check in with Kevin Gregory. Showers across central Indiana now, but look at the sharp cutoff almost with the state line with Illinois. What does that mean for your weekend plans? We've got details straight ahead. Awesome. We are matching experts this weekend. This week, the Heartland International Film Festival kicks off its 28th year, making it the longest-running film festival in our state. It brings a lot of people to Indianapolis from all over the country as well as the world. RTV6's Kelsey Anderson sat down with a filmmaker preparing for a world premiere on Sunday. Well, the Heartland International Film Festival isn't just something that people in Indiana and in the United States get excited about. It's something that people get excited about worldwide. And I'm here today with uh, film director Guy Davis. So tell me a little bit about your film. So, uh, so Philophobia is it's a coming of age story. Um, it's set in my hometown um, in like the countryside in the UK. And it's about a boy and his friendship group and the sort of mischief they get up to in like the, the last week of school. Um, but there's sort of you know, there's dark undertones and he, he's kind of trying to break away from his situation. And I guess um, it's like that transitional phase where you're worried about leaving stuff behind, but really he wants to grow and become this writer. Awesome. And so there are over 5,000 films were submitted for this. 200 were picked. You were one of those 200. What's that feeling for you and your cast and crew? Um, it's hugely exciting. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Um, and very surreal, you know. You never really know, you know, what, why you get picked or wh whether you whether you'll get in. But it's just it's great to be here. Heartland, such a fantastic festival, and um, yeah, I'm here with three of my cast and my two producers, and we're having a great time. Awesome. And so, when can people see your film? 
um, Sunday the 13th um, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, AMC Castleton Square okay. and also again Wednesday 16th. Okay and so on Sunday that's the world premiere that's of your film. Premiere. Awesome well perfect well thank you so much I appreciate it and again for more information on the Heartland Film Festival go to heartlandfilmfestival.org I'll send it back to you guys. Uh, Kelsey thank you so much there's a new series this year at the film festival they're showing films that celebrate a milestone anniversary The Wizard of Oz is one of those films it turns 80 years old this year year. As you check on your forecast, somewhere over the rainbow, there's rain and falling temperatures, Kevin Gregory. Yes. And sunshine tomorrow. Oh, even which, better. Which is very important because tomorrow in Franklin is Franklin College's homecoming, so I need a dry day. You got it. I also need a dry day for all the other college football games throughout Indiana. Yeah, it's homecoming up at Purdue. Uh, so we're good. playing at home. The Notre Dame's home. Franklin, boiler up. We're, we're good. We're just dishing it out. Sunshine for you, you, you. All, right. all 92 counties will have a dry day tomorrow, albeit a cool Saturday, but enjoyable. Patchy frost in the morning. If it weren't windy, I think we'd have widespread frost. The wind will keep the atmosphere mixed up enough. Shouldn't have much of an issue there. And as we mentioned, Saturday and Sunday, lots of sunshine from Wisconsin all the way down into Texas. Freeze warnings in effect. That's the cold side of the weather system, the cold front that just passed through central Indiana with our clouds not clearing as early and the wind staying up. That'll keep us from any freezing conditions. There's snow with this weather system. We talked about that the last couple of days. Snow right now in North Dakota and Minneapolis, St. Paul. Here's the rain over the Hoosier State. This will continue to spiral its way to the northeast and I'd say by, oh, one o'clock in the morning, the most of the rain should be over. Right now, light showers continue to move from southwest to northeast, and uh, some showers not showing up on radar, too light to detect. You'll get a good mist there. The wind is strong, 31 mile per hour gust in Muncie. The cold front most recently passed through Delaware County, 29 mile per hour gust in Indy, and the colder temperatures taking over. You'll lead the way into the 30s along the Wabash River, Lafayette down to Terre Haute. Indy's at 48 degrees. Remember, we were at 67 at 4 o'clock. 9 o'clock tonight to 11. Off to the east, move the showers and then into the Buckeye State overnight. Quite a cool start. Temperatures lower to middle 30s to the north. Central Indiana, close to the mid 30s, down to the south, also in the mid 30s. Sunshine fixes everything, nearly everything. 55 tomorrow afternoon, still breezy, not as windy as today. That's with lots of sunshine. Temperatures not quite as cool on Sunday morning. We'll still be in the upper 30s, 65 the afternoon high. We're dry Monday, but Tuesday, a chance for some showers and thunderstorms. Those thunderstorms knock us back into the 50s in the middle of next week. Everybody have a good weekend. And this is why I did not complain when we were in the 90s just a couple of days ago because... You know Indiana weather. Eventually, yeah. you know, it all sort of comes back. Kevin, thank you so much and have a good weekend. Still ahead, kids making a plea to their parents who are currently on social media. And as you take a live look outside, as Kevin just mentioned, temps are about to take that tumble. Ooh, look at that there. Rain out there. This is the News at 7 on RTV6. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. Southwest Airlines getting rid of its senior fares. The airline just announced a change on its website. It says the discount is over as of December the 11th. The senior fare could dramatically cut ticket prices, especially on the anytime fares. But details even make it better using the airline's cheapest want to get away option. Good luck with all of that. If you have a teenager, more than likely you've warned them about what they should and should not post on social media. Well, it turns out they may have the same advice for you. 42% of teens in a recent study say they have a problem with what their parents post about them. And one in 10 say it's a big problem. There's even a term for those of you who violate your terms with your children. It's called sharing you don't want to be sharing ting. A new study is generating a lot of buzz, no pun intended. Honeybees can count and apparently higher than originally thought. A previous research said that bees can count up to four and compute basic arithmetic. But the new findings reveal that they can learn numbers even higher. 22 honeybees were trained to choose between two options in a maze with different numbers of shapes. When the bees picked the correct path, they were rewarded and some were punished for heading down the wrong path. Those punished bees then learned to count the number of shapes and pick the correct path to avoid the penalty. 
wow. Researchers say bees are a lot like humans and are more likely to make the right choice to avoid a negative consequence. And we end with this, a glimmer of hope. If you had your heart set, Kevin Gregory, on walking on water, the so-called Jesus shoe sold out in just minutes this week. Uh, customers paid about $1,400 for a pair, but they're starting to pop up now on resale sites. Right now, there's a pair listed for $4,000. A design studio in Brooklyn created the Jesus shoe by injecting the soles of Nikes with holy water from the River Jordan. They, they were even blessed by a priest. The shoes also have a a crucifix that detaches from the shoe. Good luck with all of that. We're going to walk on puddles okay. and we head out in the parking lot. That's for sure. Good night. Our next newscast tonight at 11. Have a great weekend. <laughs>